thank you so much again for that lovely rendition, day by day. It's always nice to know that the Lord can be with us day by day. A pharmacist one night had to have night duty. And as the night wore on, he became uh, sleepy, and there was no business going on. No one seemed to be coming. And so he thought it would be nice to just take a nap. So he went and locked the door, went down on his cot, and went off to sleep. As he went into a deep sleep, all of a sudden, there's a rap at the door. And he was abruptly awakened out of his sleep. So shaking his head, he went to the door, opened the door, and there was a little boy with a handwritten note. Mister, can you fill this up for mom? Well, the man took the note. He was still a little groggy and uh, irritated that his good sleep had been broken. So he was anxious to get this uh, done and get the little boy out as quickly as possible. So he went to the counter, filled the prescription, and gave it to the boy, sent him off, locked the door, and went back to his cot to sleep. But for some reason, he couldn't sleep. And now he was upset that not only was he awoken, but now he couldn't go back to sleep. Well, he decided, I'll go on the counter and go through the prescriptions that I have filled and, and file them away. Well, as he was doing that, he came to the last one that he had just filled, and as he looked at it and his eyes uh, focused on it, he immediately realized that he had made a great mistake. He had placed in the bottle the wrong medicine. He shuddered to think what would happen to that unsuspecting mother as she took the medicine. And he did not know what to do, didn't know where the boy came from. And so that man went to that cot. And this time he knelt down and began to plead with God to please forgive him for his indolence and, and that God could somehow spare that mother from imminent death as she took that particular medicine. Well, as she was praying, agonizing with God, there was another rap at the door. Well, he got up, went to the door, and to his great surprise, it was the little boy. The little boy had tears in his eyes, and he said, Mr., I was running down the street, and I fell, and the bottle broke. Would you mind refilling that prescription for Mama? Oh, I'll tell you, there was one greatly relieved pharmacist. He this time went to the counter and made sure that he placed the right medicine in the bottle, sent off the boy and then went down and knelt and prayed and thanked the good Lord for sending an angel to trip that little boy so that mother could be spared and his own career as well. Our friends, listen. Isn't it true that it's important to get the right medicine? The Bible warns us about the wrong medicine. And there's something far more desperately uh, dangerous to take than just physical medicine. Spiritual medicine, the wrong spiritual medicine, can uh, have eternal consequences. Notice what God says in the book of Revelation chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. Many of you may know these references as we are turning to it, Revelation chapter 14 and uh, verse 7 through 10. Notice it says that God is warning, saying with a loud voice. What kind of voice? A loud voice. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. 
And it says there followed another angel saying, Babylon, Babylon has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in this image and receive this mark in his forehand or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wrath of God, of, pardon me, of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, that sounds, again, as I mentioned the other night, as an arbitrary God demanding something. But no, friends, God here is anxiously concerned that his children on planet Earth do not understand that there is a wrong medicine, spiritual medicine being offered, and the consequences bring eternal, fatal fatality, pardon me, to those who take it. What is this that the Bible is speaking about? Well, it's warning against the beast power. What is the beast? Well, people have different ideas of what the beast is. I think you, you probably have heard people come up with, uh, I remember, for example, several years ago when President Re Ronald Reagan was the president, they thought he was the beast. And uh, I remember, for example, there was a big, big computer that was called the beast. Uh, there are many, many, many ideas about the beast and also about 666. But I think it's important for us to see what the Bible says about this. But I want you to understand that the main issue here is that God has sent a message to planet Earth that will save, a gospel that saves. And if you remember what it says in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 6 uh, through 9, now this is Paul writing and warning the Christians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Notice. What's a concern? That there is another gospel. Then it says, which is not another, though there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he continues to write, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And Paul doesn't stop there. He simply says, and as we said before, we again so say uh, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that you have heard or received, let him be accursed. This is the strongest denunciation the Bible writers can write. Let him be accursed. Obviously, there is a controversy going on, and it is in the religious arena because we see now that one demands worship. The other one is saying, you need to watch out for that medicine that seems to be the right one, but it will bring eternal consequences. In fact, the Scripture says that there is a power that opposes and exalteth itself or himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. A counterfeit, if you please, of the gospel of Christ. Who is the beast then? What is the beast? And how will that affect you and me in the future? As we dig up the future, let's study what the Bible says first in the past. And then we go into the future. First of all, we turn to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 13, if you have your Bibles again, Revelation 13 begins with a description of the Antichrist. And here's what it says. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Then it says, And I saw one of his heads as he were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Then it says, And they worshipped the beast, pardon me, the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast as well, saying, 
who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and the, them that dwell in heaven. Then it says, finally, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell on the earth. How many? All that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the land's book, uh, the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. My friends, let me ask you a question. If God pronounces such strong denunciations about receiving the beast or, the, or worshiping the beast or receiving the mark in the forehead and the hand. Don't you think then that God wants you to know what it is? There are people who say, well, you cannot know what it is. You, the book is a closed book. But my friends, it is clear that if God warns, he only warns because he wants you to know what to evade, what you escape, and what to not accept. And so, he will not do, give us information without help, helping us to understand what it is. So, what is the beast? How can we determine what it is? And how can we come to the place where we then know how it will affect us? First of all, this particular beast that rises out of the sea, the Scripture says, looks like a, a leopard with a mouth of, of a lion. And it has seven heads and ten crowns, and the feet are the feet of a bear. Now, how many of you have been to a zoo and ever seen an animal like this? Well, no one has ever seen an animal like this. The only animal that may uh, be uh, something that appears to be parts of other, other animals is called a platypus. But otherwise, no one has ever seen a leopard-like beast with seven heads and ten horns and feet like a bear. And the, only, the, only, the interesting thing is that it is in Revelation chapter 13 in this verse that you will find it mentioning this particular animal. Where else in the Bible then can we find information that helps us to describe or to find out who this beast power is? We must turn then to the book of Daniel. And if you have your Bibles, look at Daniel chapter 7. And beginning in Daniel chapter 7, we start there with that great prophet Daniel who loved God, who prayed for understanding, and God sent understanding to him. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. You find then that there are two books that are apocalyptic in nature. There are many, many prophetic books, such as the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. These are classical prophecies. But there are two books that are apocalyptic in nature, and these books are Daniel and Revelation, sister books, as you please, if you please. One is in the Old Testament, one is in the New Testament. One sheds light on the other, and one borrows from the other. So let's find out then what the Scripture says. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So here's what Daniel saw. Then spake, and, and Daniel said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens drove upon the earth, uh, pardon me, upon the sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So Daniel saw four beasts come up out of the sea. Four beasts that come up out of the sea. Then it says that the first one is, uh, has wings of a lion. Notice verse 4. It says then, the first was like a lion, had wings, eagle wings. I uh, beheld till the wings thereof were plucked up, and it was lifted up from the earth, and may stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So the first beast is a lion with what? With wings. Then it says that the second beast is a bear. Notice verse 5. And uh, behold, another beast, a second, like unto a bear. And this particular beast, then it says, it raised, raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. So we find then that the second beast is a bear. Then there's a third beast that follows, and this third beast is in verse 6. Notice it says, After this I beheld, and lo, 
another like a leopard which had the, uh, upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. Notice it says dominion was given to it. And finally, then uh, we read the other beast. And it says, after this I saw in verse 7, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong, exceeding, and had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. Now notice, Daniel sees a beast that he cannot describe. Well, how can you describe something that has so many parts? What do you call it? As I said, the only animal that has different parts uh, is called a platypus. But other than that, uh, what do you call something that has a body of a leopard and the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion with horns, ten horns, and so many heads? There's no description. Daniel cannot describe what the beast looks like but he can give us indications of what it is. And so, what are these beasts anyway? According to verse 17 of the book of Daniel, you'll find then that these beasts are actually kingdoms. Notice it says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. That's why, if you remember, it says that dominion was given unto them. Well, normally speaking, when dominion is given unto some, somebody, it means that they have authority over the domain. So, what is this referring to? It's referring to empires that would arise, uh, and it's talking about that they are within the multitudes of people, because the seas, according to prophetic interpretation, represents nations and peoples, etc., and tongues. And so, these bees arise not in a place that's sparsely populated, but obviously arise where there's a lot of people. Then the Scripture says that there are kingdoms. So, there are kingdoms that arise where there are a lot of people there. So, what are these uh, kingdoms? Who do they represent? Well, according to what we understand, the first beast, if you remember when we studied the book of Daniel chapter 2, you remember that the first uh, had the part of the, the gold or the head of gold represented Babylon. So likewise, the lion with the two wings represents the Babylonian Empire. Then, of course, uh, you may say, is that true? Well, I went to the Pergamon Museum there in Berlin, and if you ever have an opportunity to go to Berlin, it is a splendid museum because it has artifacts there from, from many different parts of the, the world, especially from ancient Babylon, etc. And right in that uh, museum you'll find, for example, a lion with what? Well, with wings. And so, uh, the, this is a, a piece of uh, artifacts that was taken from Babylon, and you can see then that they actually had lions with what? With wings. It meant then that the lion being the king of the, of the beast, that the Babylonian Empire considered them to be the king of all the kingdoms, and the wings represented that they were able to conquer swiftly. Well then, that represents the Babylonian Empire. Then if the Babylonian Empire is represented by the lion, you remember what follows from Daniel chapter 2. You, you remember then that the bear then must represent what? The silver or the meats and the Persians. And the reason why it says that it rises up on one side is because after the meats and the Persians got together and they conquered the Babylonians, it was the Persians that uh, took the ascendancy and uh, began to be the ones that ruled the, the empire. So, you, you see then that this particular domain, and by the way, you can notice that each, each empire uh, controls more and more territory. Uh, the Medes and the Persians began in 539 when they conquered the Babylonian Empire, and uh, finally they went down in 331. And it happened because the Greeks then um, fought with them, won the battle. Alexander the Great then took the, the control of not only the part where the Babylonians and the Medes controlled, but also you see it extends all the way now to Italy. And so, uh, 331 to 168 B.C., you see then that a leopard-like beast with four heads. So, what do you have? You have a lion, you have a bear, and you have a leopard-like beast. Uh, then it's, it says that there was another beast, 
uh, that it was uh, indescribable. And this particular beast had ten horns. I want you to notice what it says about the ten horns in verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are what? Ten kings or kingdoms that shall arise and another shall arise after them and it shall be diverse. The word diverse means what? Different from the others uh, first and he shall subdue how many? Three kings. So here is a a beast then, the last beast that has ten horns, and then it says that these ten horns are actually ten kingdoms, and then it tells us that these uh, kingdoms come up from or from among the, the, uh, uh, from the division of the last kingdom, and then it says that there's another one that rises up after the ten horns, and it removes three, and if you remove three from ten, what do you have? Seven. Well, can you understand why then Daniel is projecting forward as to this thing that would come and uh, then John takes it from there and then tells us it is a leopard-like beast with a mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and it has ten horns and seven heads. In other words, the, the, the horns represent the power or authority of the kingdoms, so the ten horns remain, but the seven heads uh, are only left, which means then that the three were removed. So here's the same beast that Daniel is seeing in the, uh, in the future. John picks it up now and is telling us that this beast has uh, different parts of these different empires. So this final beast then in Revelation 13 is a beast that's made up of Babylon, Medes and the Persians, and the Greeks. In other words, what it's telling us is that it has become a composite empire. It has borrowed parts of the others. So, we see then uh, that this has taken place. Now, you may say, uh, is your inter interpretation correct? I was uh, not long ago uh, preaching a, a series like this in uh, a place called uh, Washington State. Vancouver was a city. And there was a man who I visited, who was, uh, his wife was attending my series, and she wanted to me to answer some questions. When I got to her home, the husband simply said, I don't believe that. I said, you don't believe what? He said, I don't believe that this represents that. And uh, I said, why don't you believe it? It's biblical. He said, well, you can't prove it to me. I don't believe it. And I said, uh, uh, well, that's interesting. Well, as I was sitting there, I was impressed to look at his bookcase. The library was there. And so I, I said, would you mind if I look in your bookcase? So I went to his bookcase, and there I found a Bible. A what? A Bible. And so I took it out, and I said, whose Bible is it? He said, it's my Bible. It was an old Bible. In fact, the, the front cover was kind of almost torn off. And uh, I was impressed to look in the back. And so I looked in the back. It was a Presbyterian Bible, by the way, given to him when he was a Sunday school boy in Wyoming. And it was given to him for good attendance, etc., back about 1934. And so I looked in the back and opened it uh, to a commentary by the Presbyterians concerning what I'm talking to you about. And the commentary simply says that these beasts represent who you'll understand later on. In other words, he was amazed to discover that they represented, number one, the kingdoms that I'm mentioning, and then, of course, they give some more interpretation that I can give you later on. Now, I went to Nuremberg, Germany as well. And there's a lot of history in Europe. And when I got to Nuremberg, I, I was interested to discover this building. Now, this building is a city hall. They call it a Rathhaus. And at first, when I heard Rathhaus, I thought Rathhaus. And so I thought they were, uh, why do the Germans have a rat house? And then I discovered it's the name for the city hall. Now, this city hall was built in 16 centuries. When? About the 16 centuries. And, of course, people uh, walk by there all the time because there's a, a castle up, up here. I don't, uh, you can see uh, as you walk up in the cobblestones, there's a lot of touristic things to see. And most people don't even take note of what's on that building. You see these statues here? I want you to take a closer look at these statues. Uh, they're over each door. And what I discovered was amazing. Look, 
Number one, here is a Babylonian headdress. A what? A Babylonian headdress. And what do you suppose is behind the Babylonian headdress? Why, well, there's a lion with two wings. And uh, if you look at this one, it's a Persian headdress. And what do you suppose is behind the Persian headdress? Why, well, it is a bear. It is a what? A bear. Well, let's go to the next door. What do you suppose is up there? Why, well, it's a Grecian headdress. And what do you think is behind the Grecian headdress? Why, well, it's a leopard with four heads. And then, if you notice on the other one, it's a Roman headdress. And what do you suppose is behind the Roman headdress? Well, it's an indescribable beast. And let's take a closer picture of that. Here's the ten-horned what? Beast. Isn't that amazing? And if you look at, at the, the beast even more closely, what do you suppose you see? Well, you see something very interesting. The face of a man. The Europeans, back in the 15th, 16th century, quite well understood that these beasts represented these empires. History underscores that reality. The problem is, friends, that as Americans, we do not know the history. We have forgotten a lot, and we do not know what the Bible is really saying because we are detached from all the history that's taken place. But according to to evidence, and according to his history, we can see then that these beasts actually do represent the Babylonian, the uh, Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and finally the Roman Empire. But listen, that last beast, the Roman Empire, had a little horn that would come up out of it. And you remember that, that the Roman Empire would divide into ten horns. You remember that? Just as you remember the image when it came down to the feet. How many toes did the feet have? Well, it had ten toes. So the Roman Empire would divide into how many? Into ten. And so here we have it now that's symbolized by horns. But the focus of attention of the prophet is not on the ten horns, but on the little horn that rises up and takes out three out of the way. And so notice then that the prophet says in verse 21-25, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Notice that. So who's uh, Daniel concerned about? Daniel's concerned about that little what? That little horn. Why? Because that little horn is different from the others and it actually prevails against the saints and makes war against God's people. By the way, the word saint uh, is a biblical word for people who are believers. If you're a believer in Christ and you have accepted the Lord as your Savior, you are proclaimed to be a saint. In fact, the apostles oftentimes wrote to the saints here and to the saints there. In other words, to believers. The word saint is not applied to somebody who's in heaven and who is holy, but rather to people who are humans but who believe and accept the love of Christ into their lives. So how many of you are saints here today? Uh, hopefully all of us are. Notice then that it makes war against the, the saints. Now, we continue on in discovering more and more about what this little horn does. And he speaks great words against whom? Well, against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand unto a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, the Bible is giving us several, several identifying marks about this horn. Number one, it says it speaks against the Most High. It, it makes war against the saints. And then it says that it tries to change the times and laws and also that it lasts for time at times and the dividing of times. Well, all of this is significant uh, because in the book of Revelation, it also uses the same language about another entity. This particular entity is a woman representing a church in Bible prophecy who is attacked by the enemy. And this particular church, it says, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a what? A time, a times, and, how, and half a time from the serpent. In other words, you remember it says 
that the little horn would make war with the saints. And so because it was making war with the saints, the Scripture says then that the, the, the Christians had to fly into the wilderness, as it were, to find hiding. But it says then that this power uh, would rule for a time, times, and half a times. And it says that during this time, the, the woman then who is faithful to Christ is also hiding for the same time. So what is the time, times, and half a times? Well, this is, this is uh, interesting because verse 14 says that. But look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, And the woman fled into the wilderness. You see that? Same place. Where she is, has a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. So time, times, and half a times is the same as a thousand, two hundred, and three score. Now you remember Abraham Lincoln said something about a score when he uh, did his famous speech. Well, a score is 20, and if you multiply 20 by 3, how, how much do you have? 60. So, 1,260 days. Now, this is interesting because it tells us that that power is actually ruling for 1,260 days. Well, if you uh, did not know what this symbolizes, you would think, well, 1,260 days is only three and a half years. So, that means that this power only, only rules for three and a half years? Not a long time that the people have to hide. No, but the Bible is not telling us that they're hiding for three and a half years. The Bible is saying that they're hiding for a longer period of time and that this power is given a far longer period of time than that. Because you remember, for example, the Babylonians lasted several hundred years. The Roman Empire lasted about 600 years. So it, it would stand to reason then that this power could not be lasting only three and a half years. It would have to be lasting much longer than that. So how long is it? Well, According to Bible prophecy, then, a time and times and half and times and 1260 days, the Bible says that a day equals a year. So we are actually talking about that this power would rule longer than the Roman Empire ruled. The Roman Empire ruled for about 600 years. This power is going to rule for 1260 years. And so we find then that the Antichrist would rule for how long? 1260 years. A power that would speak against God. A power that would persecute the saints. 1260 years. It would stand for reason that it could not just be three and a half years. In Revelation chapter 13, it says it would persecute the saints. In Daniel chapter 7, it says it would make war with the saints. So, in other words, this power, once it would rise out of the Roman Empire, because it says that the little horn rises from among them. From what? From among them. So, if I were to jump from this stage down into your midst, then I would be among you. And so, the, the power that rises must rise from among the Roman Empire, but in particular, it rises from among the ten horns, which is after the division of Rome. So, no wonder that Paul and John warned that the Antichrist is already here, simply because they already saw in his day, in their day, that the Antichrist was rising. Well, it would persecute the saints, and uh, it says that one of its heads would then be what? It would be wounded to death, but then it says that the wound would be healed. So now we find then that not only does it rule for 1260 years, but at the conclusion of 1260 years, there is a wound that it receives from one of its heads, but then it says that the wound is healed and that the whole world would wonder after the beast. So we're seeing then that the Bible also declares that because he is leading people into captivity, persecuting the saints, in other words, and putting them in prison, etc. It says, He that leadeth into captivity shall what? Shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, hold on, my people, because the one that's persecuting you will also suffer the same. Now, here's the question then. When did all this take place, and how can we uh, make it a lot clearer. Well, 
There are several other things that we must see, first of all. This particular power must be a religious power because it requires or demands what? Worship. And so we're seeing then more identifying marks. Uh, it would try to change the law of God and, and, uh, and the times. Notice in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it would think to change the times and the law. So obviously, let me ask you a question. By what does a government rule? By laws. Government makes laws, and by the laws rules its people. It only uses its police force to enforce what? The laws. And so, if does God have a government? What's the answer? Yes. Does that government have laws? What's the answer? Yes. Which are those laws? What moral laws have God given to us? It's called the what? The Ten Commandments. So this power would seek to change what? The times and the laws of God. And so it is exalting itself above God, and the way that governments exalt themselves above other governments is to put laws and enforce laws above the other laws that perhaps the other government had before it got toppled. So we see then many identifying marks. It would speak great words and blasphemy. Now this is an interesting word now that it's introduced. Great words and what? Blasphemy. Uh, if you were to consider this word blasphemy, I've asked people, what is blasphemy? Well, oh, you, you know, saying some swear words, cursing against God. Well, it may include that, but I want you to notice that the Bible has a definition for blasphemy. Notice how, this, how the Bible defines blasphemy. Number one, Jesus, when a man was brought to him, and they could not, because of the press, bring him uh, through the door, they went up to the roof, pull the roof apart and drop the man down in the very presence of the master. And when the Lord saw him, the Lord said to the man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, the Jews, when they heard Jesus say, thy sins be forgiven thee, what did they say Jesus was doing? Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but who? God only. So what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is when anyone takes the prerogative of God. So a person who claims to have the power of God to forgive is committing blasphemy. In other words, did Christ commit blasphemy? The answer is no. Why? Because he is God. What do you say? But for you and for me to take the same prerogatives, we are then speaking what? We're speaking blasphemy. Well, what else? Notice then, Jesus said that he and the Father were one. And the Jews then again uh, charged Christ with the same. Notice, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stoned thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself what? God. So you can see then that blasphemy is when somebody who's a man takes the prerogatives of whom? Of God. Now we have seen then that this power actually is seeking to take the prerogatives of God. And by taking his prerogatives, exalt himself above God. The Bible calls this particular power a woman. If you go to Revelation chapter 17, it calls it Babylon the Great. And the reason why it's calling it Babylon the Great is because we have just discovered that this particular power rose up after the division of Rome, which is where? In Europe. So the Antichrist had to rise out of the division of the European nations and rule the European nations for 1260 years. And it was considered to be a woman, which means it was a church. Well, we continue on to give some other descriptions about this particular woman. According to Revelation 17, verse 18, it says that the woman is a city. It is a what? The woman is a city. And so, it is a power that, that rises up out of the Roman division 
It rules Europe for 1260 years as a religious entity, and it is called a church, and also it is called a city, according to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18. Let me read that to you so you can see the, uh, how clear it says that. Revelation 17 and verse 18, it says then, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So the woman that you saw is the what? The great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And so we're finding then that this particular antichrist power, this beast power, Revelation 13, is none other than a church that ruled Europe for 1260 years and that it was a city. Well, this is very interesting. What do you say? Because the more pieces of evidence we find, the closer we get to identifying who is the actual Antichrist according to the Scriptures. I want you to notice then that it also says that this particular city sits on seven mountains. On how many? Seven mountains. So it's a woman that sits on seven mountains. That's a city. Well, you think about it. What church in Europe is a city that sits on seven mountains? As you consider this, you can see that the Bible is clear concerning what this power is. Perhaps by now I don't have to even spell it out. I think by now you can see very clearly, especially those in Europe who have a background in European history. I'm sure as we have gone through every point that now you're saying, aha, it's dawned on you. Because you all know that there's a city that sits on seven mountains. That is a church. The scripture also says that it has a leader, and this leader has a number. His name represents a number, and that number is 666. Some people have asked me the question right here in the meetings, what is 666? Well, in Canada, there, uh, a, a brochure came out, uh, and it said, learn all about sin, 666. Well, it turns out that it, it uh, really was a brochure announcing social insurance number. Learn all about sin, S-I-N, social insurance number. And it had six points. But when you looked at the brochure folded, it looked like 666. Well, I was traveling down in Jacksonville, Florida, and up on the a big billboard on the top of a building, uh, there was a, a, uh, a billboard saying 666. And so when I looked it up, up there to see what it was, it was a cough medicine with the number 666. Well, there are people who think that uh, the 666 is uh, some number that's implanted in the hand. Just recently in uh, uh, Vancouver, Washington, a man who was attending the, the meetings came to, to me and said uh, that uh, he just, he's working at Costco, and that's a, a place where people can go and buy a lot of merchandise at a lower price, uh, that as he uh, was there, that he discovered that they're already in certain supermarkets have scanning, and people actually have implanted into their hands chips that have their credit card information, if you please. So rather than having to get into the wallet and taking out the credit card, all they have to do is swipe their hand and it has all the information already. So people are saying, aha, 666. Well, if the Bible says that it is a, the number of a man's name, then we have to concur that it must be the number of the ruler who rules this particular organization, who is a city, who rules for 1260 years, who receives the wound, and uh, that persecutes the saints, and who seeks to change the law of God. So let's, let's uh, look at what the, the, the uh, review uh, says. Number one, it's a little horn that rises out of the ten divisions of Rome. Number two, it plucks up three kings. Number three, it rules European nations for 1260 years. 
Then the force diverse. In other words, the other powers were uh, military and political. This power becomes a political religious power. So it's different than the other powers. Then the, there's a man at the head. Number seven, it speaks blasphemy or takes the prerogatives of God. Uh, number eight, it persecutes uh, the people of God. It's a persecuting power during the dark ages in Europe. There's great persecution that came upon believers. It changes the, the, the uh, laws of God. It, it, I, well, it doesn't change it. It attempts to change it. No one can change the law of God. God is the one that wrote it with his finger on tables of stone, and it cannot be changed. But there is an attempt to change it. It receives a deadly wound after the 1260 years, and then it makes the world drunk with her wine, which was false doctrines. The wound is healed, and it has a number or a mark. So, you can see then, it is a woman uh, or a church. It sits on seven mountains. It is called Babylon the Great. It has a number and mark, and God's people are called out of that organization. Now, you may ask the question, who is it? What is it? I'm going to let you consider that. But I want you to consider this tonight. God in His mercy is revealing the reality that there is an attempt to usurp God and to usurp the salvation that Christ has offered to the world. Jesus has come down. He has given His blood to save you. And the Bible says there's no salvation that can be found apart from His name. In the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, there's no, no name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. In other words, friends, through Christ, you will find salvation. And why is it then that God gives such a strong denunciation against His power? It sounds like an angry God. No, friends, it's a God of love. Warning, but here's, here's what's happening. When I was a little boy in New York City, uh, we didn't have any place to play except in the street and down in the basements or in the backyard. And between the buildings, there was this open space that you can run from one building to the other. And one day, we found a bunch of mattresses out, out there. People in those days just threw the mattresses out in the, in the street, etc., yeah, especially in the ghettos. So we thought, oh, wonderful, three mattresses. We piled them up one upon the other and began to jump up and down. We had an instant trampoline, you understand? Well, we were jumping up and down, jumping up and down, and finally, after the excitement and the exhilaration, it all wore out because we couldn't jump any higher. So we thought, well, how can we get some more excitement out of this? We saw the first story window. Ah, we thought, great. So we pushed the mattresses against the building, went up the steps, and looked out the window. Now you understand that, uh, that things look a little bit farther down than they look when you look up. Isn't that true? And so, uh, you know, we were ghetto kids. No, you go first, you go first, you go first. And finally, I remember jumping out and feeling this tremendous exhilaration as uh, we came down and boom, bounced off that mattress. Well, after a while, we decided we needed uh, a little more height. And so we went up to the second story. And by this time, you can now understand that the heart is beating a little fast as you see the distance. And I didn't want to jump at this time because I, I could see how far down it was. But, you know, again, the boys, oh, you go first, you go first, you go first. So I got on the windowsill, and uh, I, was tr I was dreading this whole experience, but you know what peer pressure does, right, to kids? And so there I stood ready to take my plunge, and all of a sudden I heard some footsteps coming up behind me. And as I looked back, who do you suppose is coming up the staircase? Well, it's Mom. And she saw me perched there in the windowsill. And when she saw me, you know what she said? Isn't he sweet? He's having such a great time. You think that's what Mother said? I don't want to tell you what Mother said, but I can tell you this. She told it to me in a high, loud voice. She said something like this, Sin vergüenza, which means you shameless one. Get off of there. And then she gave me all sorts of warnings. If I didn't obey her quickly, it would be worse than if I fell out the window. She hated me, didn't she? No. 
she loved me. She saw that I was not sensible enough about what I was doing. And out of love, she called my attention so that I could escape from what would have happened to me had I jumped down. Our friends, listen. The world today is in a state where people do not know that they're about to take the plunge. God yearns to save you. He calls you out of Babylon, but you must make the choice. You must listen. You must decide for Christ or against him. My friends, today, will you turn to the Lord? Will you open your heart to him? Will you see the danger that you're in? And will you choose to accept the salvation that Christ brings to you? Will you do that today? May God bless you. Let us pray together. Our Father, thank you for the warnings that you give, for the clear revelation that you bring to our hearts. Oh God, by thy grace, help us to make the right choice and be on your side. In Jesus' name.